plus alpha prime pi tau um, plus sum over n alpha n i e to the power i n um, <coughs> tau plus sigma plus n is not equal to 0 but runs over all integers. And then we expand uh, and we divide by n, if you remember. Okay. And uh, then we expanded e to the power minus uh, plus i n tau minus sigma uh, alpha n tilde i by n. And uh, proceeded. We computed the symplectic form of the theory, we worked out the symplectic form in terms of alphas and alpha tildes, and we got an answer. The, uh, which was the answer we expected, except that it had a minus sign off. We alpha ends behaved like harmonic oscillators. The answer we got <coughs> was in the end when we computed Poisson brackets, we found uh, for n greater than zero, we found alpha n, alpha minus n was equal to minus n when we'd expected the answer with the plus sign off. Okay? And we spent some time staring at it and we couldn't figure it out last time. Um, okay, first let me get one or two trivial things out of the way. Um, you remember in the end we had to rescale these alphas by factors of alpha prime and 2. So I'll just at this point immediately put that rescaling here. So we get that irritating complication out of the way. Um, that, uh, the, the mistake we made was in the form of this expansion. You see, I wanted my alphas, alpha n's and alpha minus n's to be creation and annihilation operators, which meant that they should have been uh, harmonic yeah, Hermitian conjugates of each other, complex conjugates of each other. But you see, because of this factor of n, there's a relative minus sign between the two. So this is 5, this is comes with a minus 5. Okay, so this is not coming like alpha n plus alpha minus n. The way I've written it, it's coming like alpha n minus alpha minus n. Okay, so the way to make these things complex conjugate, so what I'm saying is that if you take this and you complex conjugate it, you ta take the star of this operation, you'll find that alpha n is minus alpha n dagger because of the n. Okay? Because n gets flipped into complex conjugation. Is this clear? So the way to fix that up, so to work with expansion coordinates so that alpha n and alpha minus n really are complex conjugates of each other. Those are the oscillators for which we should have expected standard commutation relations. The way to do that, of course, if these are operators are pure imaginary, way to make imagine I mean, if th things are uh, complex co conjugates of each other up to a minus sign, if we multiply them by i, then they will be genuinely complex conjugates of each other. Okay, so the expansion I should have done was this one, and indeed it's the one that Polchinski does. Mm. And it means closed close string. Close string. Close string. Light cone gauge. Light cone gauge. Yes. So the expansion I should have done was this one. So my oscillators, the oscillators we worked with in last class, differ from the oscillators that are Hermitian conjugates su and such that alpha n and alpha minus n are Hermitian conjugates to each other with a, with a factor of an i. So if you put that redefinition and you get a factor of i squared, which will, will flip this to n. Is this clear? So everything we did in the last class was correct. There was nothing wrong. Except we were working with weirdly normalized. What we got was, so let me say it in more detail just so that you understand. So alpha n last class commutator alpha minus n last class. Indeed, Poisson bracket. Okay, this curly thing means Poisson bracket. Indeed was equal to minus n. This was correct. But alpha n last class complex conjugate was equal to minus alpha minus n last class. Exactly. So the algebra of these operators is exactly the same as the algebra of these operators with a plus n and such that the Hermitian conjugate, the, 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 the reality property is alpha n is equal to alpha minus n star. And you can see, see that by just taking alpha, alpha n last class is equal to i times alpha n Polchinski. The good alpha n's. Okay. And indeed, Polchinski did have an I there. I sort of ignored it and I ran into trouble. That I wasn't there for decoration. It was there to make things real. <laughs> okay? 
So we messed up in a, st in a bad way. We unmess it, and we get the right, uh, the, the right uh, commutation relationship. Yes. Why did we expand x sine and Fourier mode? So, uh, you see, what we did was to solve the equations of motion uh, for the x fields. You remember that our solution was that the most our answer was that the most general solution was a function of x plus plus a function of x minus. Moreover, we were dealing with a closed string. Sigma plus and sigma minus. Uh, so, uh, sorry, yes, sigma plus and sigma minus. Yes, sorry. Moreover, we were dealing with the closed string. So these functions had to have the fact that they were periodic. Under sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi. Apart from the zero mode, which could interfere, in which these two things could interfere so as to cancel things, this meant that for anything that is not the zero mode, the functions of sigma plus and sigma minus had to be periodic functions. Sorry, this is for sigma the zero mode? Yeah. Let's look at the zero mode se separately. But first, let's uh, apart from the zero mode, you understand it? So it's. I don't know if it's like that's different at all. But apart from the zero, zero mode, it should be zero mode. OK. So let's see. What we need is that xi of sigma plus 2 pi has to be equal to xi of sigma. Then let's say we took xi and we wrote it as xi is equal to fi of sigma plus plus gi of sigma minus. Now we have to impose the periodicity condition. OK? We want to impose the periodicity. So let's first, OK, we want to impose the periodicity condition on the function xi, OK, not on f and g separately. Suppose we impose the periodic uh, periodicity condition on f and g separately. What will we get? We get that f and g are periodic functions of, of sigmas, and so they can be expanded in Fourier mode. Clearly, if we impose the periodicity condition on f and g, we've got a periodic function for x. That is obvious because x is f plus g. What is not clear is that we can get away getting a, f a, peri uh, a function that's periodic in, in x even though f and g were not themselves periodic. OK? Now, you see, how can that work? You see, all we wanted was that x was a function of, uh, was a periodic function of sigma. So suppose we had non-periodic functions of sigma plus plus sigma minus. Uh, non-periodic functions of sigma plus plus a non-periodic function of sigma minus that end, uh, ended up not involving sigma, ended up only involving tau then that would obviously be a periodic function of sigma because it would be a constant. So that's the one caveat, the one way out. Now, can we get that? We can if we choose xi to be a times sigma plus plus a times sigma minus. Because a times sigma plus plus sigma minus is simply equal to 2a times tau. No, 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 not a, not a general function. Suppose we took a times sigma plus squared plus a times sigma minus squared. Function of what? Okay. The only thing that we could choose, one thing that's obvious, is make this periodic and this periodic. The only other thing that we can do is to choose constants. I mean, linear dependence on sigma. Of course, constant works. But that's periodic by itself. So that's part of this periodic and this periodic. But you can choose a linear dependence on sigma, which is not periodic in sigma plus, not periodic in sigma minus, but is periodic in sigma if you choose the coefficients of the two constants to be the same, the linear paths to be the same. Is this clear? Yeah. That's the only thing. Yeah. OK? That's, that's what I call zero mode. Anything without any oscillator frequency is called zero mode. Is this clear? Yeah. OK. Um, so where were we? Where were we? W or what? Uh, where, where were we? Uh, we? We've completed this quantization. So I was trying to say something. Does anyone remember where we got interrupted? Yeah, I mean, the i makes it real. And then yeah, and uh, we just uh, wanted to canonically quantize it after uh, opening the 
Yeah. Uh, now we would have uh, the. Okay, can you remember what I, what I was saying when you asked your question? I was trying to make a point which I've forgotten, but it, 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 it doesn't matter. Okay, so, 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 so let's move on. Um, uh, okay, uh, fine. So, so, so we've, got, we've got the solution, and we've, uh, we've got that the algebra is that of harmonic oscillators in alpha and alpha tilde, and in addition, we've got these zero modes. Okay. Um, by the way, that the rest of the commutation relationship works out with just an n, you can actually see in your head. You see, the symplectic structure had an alpha dot, delta alpha dot times delta alpha with a 1 by 2 pi alpha prime. Because the action had 1 by 4 pi alpha prime. So we had to do dp wedge dq. p had a factor of 2, so that's 1 by 2 pi alpha prime. Okay. Then we plug this in, and the 2 pi gets killed when we do the integral. You only get contributions when momenta meet each other. When, you get the, when the momenta meet each other, the 2 pi gets killed when you do the integral. Okay? But remember that there were two factors. There was alpha n with alpha minus n, and alpha minus n with alpha n. So there was an additional factor of 2. Okay? So the number, apart from the sign, will work out to 2 by alpha prime. Remember, we started with 1 by 2 pi alpha prime. 2 pi got killed because of the, the integral over the circle. And then we got an additional factor of 2 because there were two things, alpha n with alpha minus n and alpha minus n with alpha n. So it becomes 2 by alpha prime. That's why this is alpha, n, alpha prime by 2. Square, when we put it the square root, it squares, it kills this alpha prime by 2. So that part we can sort of more or less see right from the beginning. Okay? The sign is more tricky, and we checked that it worked out nicely. Is this clear? OK, great. So we've completed this cano the canonical quantization of our system in the non-zero mode set. Okay, so what have we got? We've got that th that we've got the symplectic forms on twenty f uh, on d minus two uh, alphas, uh, uh, harmonic oscillators with frequencies from one to infinity. We still have to deal with the zero modes. Now the zero modes. The way we're going to deal with the zero modes is as follows. What we're going to do with the zero modes is exactly what we did with the particle action. Okay, and that is. We're going to treat the symplectic structure of the zero modes as if they were completely unconstrained. And in the zero mode sector, impose the constraints as first class constraints. Do you remember that's what we did with the particle? Uh, at least one of our many ways of dealing with the particle. Uh, we got uh, the, c the constraints. You remember we had this constraint from the equation of motion of E, the last way of doing it. We had this constraint from the equation of motion of E. Then we Set E to be something nice. That's like setting a metric here to be E mu nu on the well sheet. Okay, and then what we did was to quantize the particle action that we got, which was a simple x dot squared action. Okay, and then after we quantized it, put the equation of motion that came from varying E as a constraint that you had to impose on wave functions of the particle. Okay, we had to do that because these constraints in the zero mode sector are first class. Unlike the constraints in the oscillator sector, which are second class. You see, what were the constraints? The constraints were del minus x, x mu, del minus x mu, and similar with plus, was equal to 0. Now you take these guys, and you take these constraints, and you Fourier expand them. <coughs> in Fourier space, for every n constraint, there's a minus n constraint. And these two constraints are canonically conjugate to each other. So these are second class constraints. You can just throw away those degrees of freedom. So the oscillators in the twenty, in the, in the remaining two directions, the non-transverse oscillators, we could just throw away. Okay, but for the zero mode sector, th there's only one zero mode. There's not a zero or a minus zero mode. There's only one. So these constraints are, they don't come in canonically conjugate pairs. So we have to treat them as they are first-class constraints. We have to deal with them separately. Okay, so we, we deal with. The PIs and XIs, okay? We deal with the PIs and XIs uh, in a logically different way than we deal with the alphas, okay? So we deal with the no zero mode part of this constraint is what I'm saying, in a logically different way from the w the from the non-zero mode of mo uh, mode part of the constraint. We use the non-zero mode part of this constraint to completely eliminate 
D oscillators in the capital X plus directions. We solved for those capital X plus oscillators in terms of the other guys and just eliminated them. They never entered the symplectic form, and they will not in, in any interesting way enter this constraint, as we will see. Okay? But for the zero modes, we're going to treat these as first class constraints and impose them as equations uh, uh, that we will impose on wave functions. So, so all that I've said so far can be summarized by saying in the zero mode sector, so just I'm writing down just the zero mode sector now, I treat all coordinates as the same. Plus, minus i are all treated similarly. All of them are expanded as x mu 0 x mu 0 plus uh, p mu alpha prime uh, times tau. OK? And with this expansion, of course, this expansion is done so that x 0 mu x p mm, nu is equal to delta mu. Lowering is done with the space-time metric eta. OK, that was the, the, the fact that we would get this Poisson bracket was the reason we chose the alpha prime. Can somebody, somebody show me if we use the standard, uh, if we use the action that this will follow? Some, I'll write it on the board, but can somebody guide me? What should I write? So I'm going to start. Let's, let's do it for xi. So the action for xi was xi dot squared minus xi prime squared 1 by 4 pi alpha prime. Now can you show me that with this action and this expansion, p, x, and p are canonically conjugate to each other? So just plug in the zero mode part into this thing. Xi prime squared goes away. We can do the integral over sigma. That kills the 2 pi. Yeah. So we get 1 by 2 alpha prime x dot squared, where x dot is now just 0 mode part. And uh, this is just uh, now over d tau. Uh, oh, just over d tau. Now we compute the momentum conjugate to x. That's x dot by alpha prime. So in the zero mode, so, so a fancy way of saying this is that in the zero mode sector, the symplectic form is delta x dot wedge delta x by alpha prime. Okay, now plug this in, plug this expansion into that. So that will give us delta p wedge delta x. With no alpha prime, that's the by alpha prime cancels this alpha prime. Okay, which this is the reason I put the p, uh, the alpha prime here behind the p. Is this clear? Okay. Oh, I mean, just more less sophisticatedly, all I'm saying is that the momentum is x dot divided by alpha prime. So if you if you if you've got linear motion here, you should multiply this by x dot. But since momentum is x dot developed by alpha prime, x dot is p times alpha prime. <coughs> is this clear? OK. So of course, you, you know, this is just an expa arbitrary expansion of a solution. You can write any number here. But once you write the number, you make your choice of convention, the Poisson bracket will be something fixed. So I've chosen this, you know, this alpha prime has meaning. Because with this choice of alpha prime, I get the right Poisson bracket. Is this clear? OK, excellent. So in the, in the zero mode sector, our expansion is just x, x zero mu plus p mu alpha prime tau. And that's it. Now what I'm going to do is to evaluate the zero mode part of this constraint. We've already done, dealt with the non-zero mode parts of the constraint. You remember that? We used that to solve for the x plus oscillators. We still have to deal with the zero mode parts of the constraint. So let's evaluate the zero mode part of the constraint. Now the interesting thing is that because this is bilinear, now because we're interested only in the zero mode part, we might as well take this and integrate over sigma. Because that, that focuses on the zero mode. So let's evaluate d sigma del minus 
É que mil? Exactly, that's what zero mode means. Right, zero mode is to project onto the part that doesn't depend on sigma. Or any function can be expanded in a Fourier series in sigma, and we're picking out the constant part. So inter in integration projects onto that. Is this clear? Um, you see, this whole constraint, let's call the constraint C, could be expanded in a Fourier series in sigma. Right. E to the power i m sigma, m is equal to minus infinity to infinity. All the non-zero m's we have already used. We are interested only in m equals 0. So we don't want to look at the whole constraint. We only want the m equals 0 part of the constraint. What's an easy way of focusing on the m equals i m 0? Oh. Just integrating. <laughs> Yeah, just project it onto the zero, m equals 0 part. Is this clear? Yeah. OK. So now see, even though we're interested in only the 0 mode part of the constraint, it's not only the 0 modes that contribute to that. Because the expression that we have is quadratic in, de in del minus x. So we'll get a contribution from 0 modes and a contribution from non-zero modes. Let's evaluate them separately. OK. So in order to do that, let's take our expansion and evaluate del minus of x. So first I'll evaluate del minus of xi and then just the covariant expression is xp. Uh, or just, okay, let me just evaluate del minus xi. Well, let me de evaluate del minus xi and then I'll covariant that. So del minus xi is what? From here, we can write tau as tau plus sigma plus tau minus sigma divided by 2. Tau plus sigma was what we called x sigma plus. Tau minus sigma is what we call sigma minus. So this is, so you see that this part will give me an alpha prime pi by 2. OK? Uh, alpha prime pi by 2. And uh, uh, yeah, if, if Sorry, you're, you're probably right. With the minus, so let oh. me let me see. Well, if, if, tau, if it's tau plus minus sigma, then? So it'll be tau plus sigma. Plus, uh, she, she's saying because we're doing minus. Plus tau minus sigma. Ah, uh, no, no, it's it's always. It's, it's always, yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah sigma yeah, minus. Yeah. OK. What about the non-zero modes? Well, the non-zero modes here are basically, tu this n was put in so that this derivative becomes simple. So we get plus i times uh, square root alpha prime by 2. That has not changed. Uh, times some n not equal to 0. And then these n's are cancelling. So we get alpha n i. I cancels with the i alpha. Ah, good. And it becomes minus. Minus, minus. yes. Thank you. Minus. Alpha n i e to the power i n sigma plus. And then there is a, uh, because we're taking derivative with respect <coughs> to, uh, uh, no, it's the same. So because this oh. is. Oh, oh, over here? Uh, this is percent. not contributing. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the it's just. Uh, yeah, it just it's just this. We yeah, and it's over in or as well. Minus. Okay. Huh? Uh, alpha tilde. Tilde. Thank you. Alpha tilde. Let me get rid of tilde as well. Plus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, there'll be similar algebra for it. Minus. Okay. Great. So now what we have to do is to square this guy. So we will get, now you see we're going to square and integrate. So cross terms between zero modes and non-zero modes will integrate to zero. So what we'll get is alpha prime pi by 2, the whole thing squared, OK? Plus, and now we only need to keep n with minus n, because we want something that will integrate to something non-zero. Uh, so we'll get plus alpha prime by 2, alpha n i, alpha minus n i, sum n not equal to 0. Uh, yeah, the square root has gone away. Um, well, everything will have a 2 pi. Right. So when I integrate, I'll get a 2 pi, but that's overall so that it's not, it doesn't matter. 
What? You will get anti-commutators. That's correct. Uh, so the comment here was that if we want to write this in terms of, uh, um, if we want to write this in terms of uh, a sum from n is equal to one to infinity, what you will get is two pi. So, so let's ignore the two pi. We have alpha prime pi by two, the whole thing squared, plus alpha prime by two times sum n is equal to one to infinity alpha n i alpha minus n i plus alpha minus n i alpha n i. This has to be equal to zero. This I've got in the i sector. But you know the constraint involves plus and minus directions as well. However, in the plus minus direction, only the zero mode function. Why is that? It's because x minus was by choice of gauge set equal to a zero mode. Mm. And zero mode times non-zero mode integrates to zero. Okay? So only the zero mode contributes. So all we have to do is to covariantize this expression. So I make this p. So I'll write this a bit better. I'll write this as alpha prime by two, the whole thing squared. And this was pi squared, I'll just make it p mu squared. With our choice of metric, pi squared is the positive part of p mu squared. And then we're done. Okay, now that I've written like this, I'll cancel one alpha prime by two. So in fact, I'll write this as two by alpha prime. Okay, now we're in business. Now we're in business, we can clearly state what, what Hilbert space we get from our quantization. Firstly, let us note that, uh, okay, let, let me write it one, one more. Go on. So we covariantized pi squared with pu squared. Uh, what about this uh, alpha is? Uh, that was the comment that the no, z non-zero um, zero mode yeah, part. Yeah, this was a specific gauge, but uh, can it be cast in some uh, gauge invariant form? Yes, yes, it can. But for that, that's the next part of the course after today. I see. Right now, we're working in light cone gauge, mm. so we've explicitly broken that Lorentz invariance. Okay, so in this case, we get a non-covariant looking expression. Mm. So we will, by the end of this lecture, explicitly do one check of Lorentz. You'll see, uh, of, of the final answer. Okay, now let us write this in another way. You see, we know that alpha n is like a destruction operator. We s this was the fact, uh, whether it's plus or minus that we talked about a lot. Alpha n for positive n is like a destruction operator. Okay, so this I can write as p mu squared is equal to four by alpha prime. Um, or maybe I'll write it as, yeah, okay, let, let me write it as, yeah, four by alpha prime into um, alpha i minus n alpha <coughs> i n plus what you'd get by you see, this was already in the right order, but this was not. So you have to move it around. Okay? But, uh, yeah, so that gives us plus n by 2. You see? Because when I moved this, I used the commutator alpha n, commutator minus, um, let me write it down, alpha n alpha minus n is equal to alpha n commutator alpha minus n plus alpha minus n alpha n. And this commutator, as we checked painstakingly, was plus n. And an overall minus n, right? No, no minus n. This is equal to alpha no, n. No, uh, in the first slide, in the first line. Ah, in the first slide. Yes, yes, <coughs> there's an alpha prime. Mm -hmm. 
All good? Okay. So, uh, so now what we are going to do is to try to make sense of this formula. So firstly, let, um, and this of course is some n is equal to 1 to infinity. So the first thing we're going to do is to understand the logical structure of the answer we've got. What is the Hilbert space we got by quantizing the string? The Hilbert space is vectors is, for, is d minus 2 into infinity harmonic oscillators of energies of frequencies 1, the infinity is frequencies 1, 2, 3 up to infinity. So d minus 2 copies of that times function, square integrable functions of d variables. That's what came from quantizing the zero mode part. Because <coughs> the zero mode part was just canonical commutation between x and p. It's like non relativistic quantum mechanics. So square integrable functions of d functions. But subject to this constraint. OK? So the subject to this constraint, what does it mean? Subject to this constraint means the following. It means that this quantity, which is implemented in, in Hilbert space by minus uh, del mu, the whole thing squared. Okay, so minus del mu the whole thing squared is equal to this quant this object here. Minus because p mu is i times del by del x. Uh, so it's equal to minus four by alpha prime um, sum, sum over n alpha minus n i alpha n i plus n by two. Okay, but in our conventions. Um, minus del mu squared is equal to m squared. Is a Schrodinger equation, or it's a Klein-Gordon equation for a particle of mass m. Or another way of saying it is del mu squared plus m squared on phi is equal to 0 is a Klein-Gordon equation for a particle of mass m. Ah. Exactly, exactly. Therefore, we have a formula. We have a formula which says that m squared is equal to 4 by alpha prime sum over n alpha n i alpha n alpha uh, alpha minus n i alpha n i plus n by 2. Alpha minus n, alpha n, correct. Alpha minus n, alpha n. Now, there are, there's one, of course, obvious issue with this formula, which we're going to deal with immediately, namely that uh, this part looks a little bad. You know, the sum over infinity, we're going to deal with that. Okay? But ignore that for a moment. It's some number. Imagine it's a number. Um, uh, it's a very big number. You'll see it's actually very small. <laughs> no, it's a negative number. <laughs> it's quite negative. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> uh, ignoring that fact, the structure of the this constraint is that different occupation numbers of the harmonic oscillator give rise to particles in space-time of different masses. And this here gives you the formula for the mass of the particle in space. Okay, so we finished our quantization well, well, up to one thing. We've only looked at del del plus. Uh, could you please uh, relate how we are uh, using a particle interpretation out of it? In particular, uh, how you are uh, interpreting uh, as excitation of some field like phi. Uh, what uh, exactly? Is going Let us remember what we had. What was a Hilbert space? A Hilbert space was some set of wave functions, okay, which belong to a, which belong to some Hilbert space. Now I'm going to write down what that Hilbert space. Is. That Hilbert space is a direct product Hilbert space. Right. The first part of that direct product Hilbert space is square integrable wave functions of d variables, 
Where did that come from? It came from quantizing, exactly, the Poisson bracket, bracket of x0 with p. That is just what you do in standard quantum mechanics. You know the Hilbert space for that is square integrable for functions of d variables. And then you had in addition all these harmonic oscillator Hilbert space. Now, remember we had this equation as a constraint. Yes. And the constraint told us that this equation was obeyed if m squared was this quantity. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to come to the alpha tilde part in just one minute. E exactly. But let's let's look at this now. You see that for any given harmonic oscillator excitation number, this is simply a Klein Gordon equation of a particle of mass m. Suppose you looked at suppose you looked at a vector in the harmonic oscillator space that was not a particular oscillator number. Well, you'll get a superposition of two wave functions. One for a particle of mass m1, another for a particle of mass m2. Okay, so you see that the Hilbert space that has come out of this is the Hilbert space of wave functions. But we get first quantized, mind you. We're getting first quantized picture. It's Hilbert space of wave functions of an infinite number of particles whose mass whose identity is labeled by the particular excitations in the harmonic oscillator space mm. and whose mass is given in terms of its identity by this formula. Is this clear? There are no jumps here. It's just algorithmic following through procedure. Uh, well, that depends on what n is, yeah. what the sum over n is. We'll, we'll come to that. Well, you know, it's minus 1 over 12 for each i. Uh, the, there's a sum over i here. Uh, hang on. <laughs> okay, is this clear? All good? Uh, uh, the sum over i also uh, includes uh, the uh, n over 2, right? Uh, I mean, yes, the both yes. Both, both things are some. And, uh, I mean the sum over i is outside. Okay? Now let's go, go back to the fact that we solved only one of the two constraints. We have a similar constraint from the other side. That will give us the same equation, except alpha will be replaced by alpha tilde. So you see, we have something interesting. The interesting thing we found is that the oscillator number on the left and the right are not completely independent of each other. Because you see, the zero mode part has to obey constraints from the left and constraint from the right. Constraint from the left is this equation with m squared given by this quantity on the, with the left. Constraint from the right is the same equation with m squared given by the same quantity on the right. So it must be the only way that these, these uh, both equations are can be consistent is if alpha n i, alpha n i sum over i is equal to alpha minus tilde n i, alpha tilde in i, the sum goes over i and in. Okay, so you have to choose arbitrary excitation on the left by, by left I mean left movers. These things, of course, arbitrary excitation on the right, but not quite arbitrary. The two excitations have to be tuned so that their oscillator number has to match. It's a very weak constraint. It's called the living level matching constraint. It's a very weak constraint where it's there. Once you've done that, you're free to choose arbitrary vectors in the Hilbert spaces up to this one constraint. And once you've chosen that, uh, you get a wave function in space that tells you that your particle is uh, obeys a Klein Gordon equation with this mass formula. All good? This this equation? You see, we got this condition del minus del mu squared is equal to this. But we'll get the same condition replacing alphas with alpha tildes, subtracting the two equations. These two have to be equal to each other. That's all. Meaning, there is mass square is a physical thing. You can't get one mass square from the left and another, another mass square from the right. Plus and minus.
No, there is a chance, and in fact, it will happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. D didn't you know one plus two plus three was a negative? <laughs> 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 okay, we we we're going to describe that immediately. <laughs> yes. Yes, this one. This one, yeah. Some part of the initial module and go to the base system. Yeah. And then you build this equation. And it isn't that A will get the same equation if you do this uh, other way. A you can choose your sigma in any way. Exactly, exactly. Now Yeah, yeah, we're, 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 yeah, right. So Indraniel's asking, um, Indraniel's asking, the origin of this constraint looks like the following. You know, there is a part of diffeomorphism that has been that is not fixed. Okay, that the part of diffeomorphism is shifts in sigma. Okay, now if you look at what shifts in sigma couples to, it couples to left minus right. Because sigma plus is sigma plus uh, tau plus sigma, and sigma minus is tau minus sigma. So everything, if you've got some function in tau, in tau plus and tau minus, if you shift sigma, it'll fix shift sigma plus with a plus, but sigma minus with a minus. So everything will couple to tau. And so this something on the left is equal to something on the right is same as something from left minus something from right is equal to zero has the flavor of some coming from shifts in sigma, and he's completely correct. So now the question. The question was, how does it connect up with what we, we were doing? Well, it's the same thing. Because you see, where did these constraints come from? These constraints came from the unfixed diffeomorphisms. They were all unfixed diffeomorphisms of the form sigma, go, uh, sigma plus goes to sigma pl some function of sigma plus, and sigma minus goes to some function of sigma minus. In fact, those, only those diffeomorphisms were allowed that uh, respect to the periodicity of sigma. So those diffeomorphisms could be expanded in Fourier series. Okay? The nth Fourier mode of that diffeomorphism gave rise to the nth Fourier mode of this constraint. The zeroth mode of that diffeomorphism gave rise to the zero mode of this constraint. And the zero mode is the one you're talking about. Part one part of it. Okay, so it's the same thing. Is this clear? So in you just unpackage that for you a little bit. You know, the, the zero mode part of the picture. Okay, excellent. Let's keep going. <coughs> so now what we're gonna deal with is the fact that we've got a very nice looking formula, except that we've got this this stuff here. Okay, and we have to understand what it is, what it means, and uh, what's going on. Okay. So, uh, fix that. So, uh, to fix x plus 2 this term to zero. Yes. Do you, do you use this uh, uh, you use the sigma for limit to some function of sigma plus and sigma minus goes to some function of sigma minus? Now, the argument is that uh, if I'm doing this transformation, I can't make a, uh, I mean, I, I can't get rid of zero mode, but I can get rid of oscillator by doing this. Yes. Right. How will that generate a skip in sigma? Yeah, you, you know, there are two things that, you know, when you have a gauge symmetry, there are two things. You get, you, every gauge symmetry give, gets rid of two, two modes. One, because you can fix mode, fix gauge, and second, because there's an equation of motion left behind after you fix gauge. Okay? Here, we were not using the fixing of gauge. We were using the equation of motion that was conjugate to having fixed the gauge. So we could are free to do both things. Okay. Okay? okay? So we should mix them up. Okay, good. Other questions, comments? A good question. Other questions, comments? Excellent. So let's keep going. Now. About getting rid of two degrees of freedom?
Okay, let's let's take the uh, let's take the equation uh, one one uh, one example from electrodynamics. This is gas flow, imposing gas flow is the resisting electron return. This is what you Exactly. So suppose we work in the A zero equals zero gauge. If we work in A zero equals zero gauge, well, we set A zero to zero, but the equation of motion also tells us that del dot e. A equation of motion of A zero tells us that del dot e is equal to zero. Okay. <coughs> Now del dot e when a0 is equal to 0, e was what? It was just del 0 ai. So this tells us that del 0 of del, uh, uh, del i ai is equal to 0. And that's the second equation that allows us to get rid of del, AI, del i ai. Well, it's a completely generic thing in gauge series. So each gauge condition gets rid of two degrees of freedom. That's also what we've used. Anyway, forget it. Let's not. Yeah, fine. So, uh, so, so, let's keep going. So now, what we have to deal with. Now, what we have to deal with is this this stupid thing here. What is it? sum over n? Why is why is it coming? Why? Wh how do we deal with it? Uh, and how do we deal with it physically? You know, not by somebody's prescription, but how do we deal with it physically? Well, first, let's understand why, where it arises from. You see, this thing here on the left and on the right was, as we discussed with Indranil just now, basically left minus right was the mom momentum, shifts in sigma, came from shifts in sigma, whereas left plus right was tau, was Hamilton, shifts in tau. Okay? So now that we've imposed this level matching constraint, the fact that this is equal to this, we've al we already know. So each of these constraints are the same as just saying that the Hamiltonian on the well sheet of the string must vanish. That's what the constraint is. Is this clear? What I've said is actually very, uh, very straightforward. You see, this thing here, what was it? It was the derivative of the well sheet Lagrangian with respect to a particular component of the metric. So this thing is what we call T plus plus. The plus plus component of a stress tense. All I'm saying, and you can check this, is that provided that if you know that integral T plus plus is equal to integral T minus minus, then integral T plus plus and integral t minus minus are both proportional to the integral t0, 0, which is the Hamilton. Okay, so what, what we, we know that t plus minus is equal to 0. It's some trivial algebra. Do you understand? If you, uh, see, if you work this out, the integral t plus plus, what can it give you? It can give you, uh, now if you work it out in terms of tau and sigma, what can it, what can it give you? Okay, uh, it, it can give you uh, some combination of Hamiltonian and momentum. Okay, it's some combination of Hamiltonian and momentum, and uh, uh, if you work it out, it, you'll check that it's, the, it's the, ha the Hamiltonian if the momentum is zero, because the momentum is zero, so wherever you get momentum, you just set zero. Hey, anyway, that doesn't matter very much. Yes? What was the point? Yeah. All I wanted to say is that this quantity here now, the level matching constraint, is simply the statement that the Hamiltonian on the well sheet of the string is to be set to zero. Of course, we have to set the Hamiltonian on the well sheet to, to zero. You could have said this from the beginning, because we have to set the full stress tensor to zero. Every component of the stress tensor is being set to zero. So, in particular, the Hamiltonian is being set to zero. You work out the Hamiltonian, you'll find it's proportional to that. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, that it's actually going to be proportional to the thing from left plus right, but we know that they're equal. Okay? So all we are doing here is setting the Hamiltonian on the well sheet to zero. And this sum over n, now when you think of it in that language, can you explain to me what's happening? Wha Very good. The zero point energy. You see, we know what a Hilbert space is. It's a bunch of oscillators. 
Now, each oscillator in its vacuum has a non-zero energy, omega by 2. And all we're doing is getting here the sum of energies of each of these oscillators. So we're getting the zero point energy of the first oscillator, the second oscillator, the third oscillator, and so on, up to infinity, all d minus 2 of them. That's all that this condition is, is saying. It's saying that the Hamiltonian of this quantum field theory, the quantum field theory that was the well sheet of the string, has infinite zero point energy. So when you set, it, set the ha value of the Hamiltonian to zero, you get something weird because on one side it's infinite. But now this value to having recognized this. Why is the value to having recognized this? It's because now we've, we've converted this to a problem that we, are, we understand how to solve. Because this is just the problem that whenever you study a quantum field theory, you get divergence. How do we deal with that? Well, we deal with that in the usual way. That is, we add counter terms to the action so as to ensure that Physical results are divergence-free and have the properties that we want. Okay, so so far what we've been doing is the classical theory. So let's look at the xi theory. We were doing the classical theory, xi dot squared minus xi prime squared. Or oh, I'll write it more more beautifully looking. Del alpha xi, del alpha xi. Okay, in a normal quantum field theory. This is perfectly well defined by itself. It has an infinite ground state energy, but we don't care because ground state energies are meaningless. Only energy differences are important. However, in our context, we were doing two-dimensional gravity because the metric was dynamical. Gravity couples to energy, and so energy, absolute energies are physical. So we have to work more carefully than we do in ordinary quantum field theory. So even divergences in what would normally be an unphysical quantity, like the ground state energy, has to be dealt with. So we need to add a counter term to deal with this, uh, with this divergence. Okay. So now let us be even, even, even more sophisticated. Let's write this as square root g, g alpha beta, del alpha xi, del beta xi. Now we're getting, a, uh, we're getting an infinite energy. Can you think of a uh, counter term we could add? to this action that will not change its equations of motion in a classic way. Uh, no, if we added r, uh, it would not even change the energy because it was topological. We wanted to change the energy, but not none of the motion of the x's. Cosmological, Cosmological constant. So let's add plus lambda square. We don't yet know what lambda square is. Uh, times square root g. I've got the square root g, yes, sorry. Let's add plus lambda squared times square root g. Now this shifts the, uh, the energy of, the, uh, of our string by a quantity proportional to lambda squared. In fact, what I'm going to do is to generalize. We've so far been discussing strings of length to pi. But in my head now, let me, now for the next 10 minutes, let's work with the string of length l because it'll be useful to have the two parameters separate to play with. So what is the shift in energy of this because, uh, because of the cosmological constant? It's some number, we could put some number here, times lambda squared divided by L, oh, sorry, times L, times L, because we have to integrate over the, uh, over the length of the string. Is this clear? What? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only interested in doing this about flat space. I put the square root g factor just so that you see the structure. And in the end, I said g to be flat. And so that you can vary with respect to the net length of the space. Okay, this number, uh, maybe some plus or minus, it doesn't matter very much for what we want to do. What we have to understand is this, that any divert, any quantity in the energy that is proportional to the length of the string can be removed by an appropriate counter term. But we also have to understand that, and this is the nature of renormalization in quantum field theory, you cannot do anything you want. 
unless you radically change everything, you change the equation of motions in the x's and so on, you can only remove that part of the energy that is proportional to the length of the string. Because according to the rules of quantum field theory, all we are allowed to do is to add a local counter term to an action. Once you have added that local counter term, the L dependence is fixed. If it is this kind of function. Is this clear? So, if we get a divergence that is, if we have some part of the energy that is proportional to the length of our space, that part can be tre freely traded and has to be, you know, we will have to choose a counter term so something good happens. So, you told this is consistent with this energy. What? Yes, it's consistent with well, it's consistent with diffeomorphism index. It's not consistent with while invariance. However, we you see that's the problem. The problem is that our theory, that quantum mechanics, what when the thea while the theory was classically while invariant, the quantum theory is breaking that while invariance. We'll see that in a minute. In particular, if we get a contribution to the energy proportional to length, that breaks while invariance. So, uh, sorry, I'll just finish this. So, what we're going to do is to restore while invariance by adding a counter term which will remove the bad part. How we'll do it in the screwed part of the course is to remove the part of the energy proportional to length. Okay, then you said that the final quantum field is while invariant because it's invariant, it does not care about the length. Yes, and of course, this is not by itself a proof, this is by, uh, but not by itself a proof that it's while invariant. Okay, because we've just one condition has been imposed. In, in the next five lectures in the course, we will carefully do this. We'll show it very carefully uh, when we quantize it covariantly that it will be while invariant. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know exactly like why it's going to be anomalous, right? But like how the term is broken, right? But like you just said we make sure that the quantum theory also has while invariant. Why would we want the quantum theory? Why would we want the quantum theory to be while invariant? Because what we were trying to do was to quantize the Nambu Goto action. Now, what was the connection between the Nambu Goto action and the thing we're actually doing? An equivalence class of solutions of the thing we're actually doing correspond to one solution of the Nambu Goto action. So we want to mod out by this equivalence class. That was the while invariant. If we end up with a theory that is not while invariant, we may be studying an interesting theory. But it's not the theory we started out trying to study. Okay, so for this reason, for us, the while invariance is sacrosanct, because what we wanted to do was to quantize the Nambu Goto action. Okay, the while was just some mathematic, you know, the while freedom was just there to make life easy. If it suddenly starts gaining dynamics, if it's, you can't mod out by it, you can't mod out by something that's not a connection. You can't mod out by it, it will have its own dynamics and that's just completely changing the problem you wanted to solve. We are not going to allow that, at least not in our first round. Yeah. So, you actually pulled out the lambda plus sum, the action is integration under the world matrix. Classically. Oh, so, why is that? You see, there is the action as the path integral measure. We will be studying all this very carefully, but you path integral measures are rarely invariant under wild transitions. Because you know to, to define a measure you need to put a cutoff. You do a scaling that cutoff changes. Okay, so what we are encountering here is that the quantum theory, even though we try the classical theory was wild invariant. In general, the quantum theory is not. You have to try to re add a counter term to restore the wild invariance of the quantum theory. Okay? In particular, in the limit L goes to infinity, the energy of the ground state should be zero. Because a while invariant theory is a theory that has no inherent length scale in it. The only way you can get something non-zero in an infinite length system is to have an intrinsic number, so intrinsic scale in your problem that will set the energy density. Okay? So in particular, if we are going to get scale invariance in our theory, it had better be that the energy of the and scale and then supply to everything including the ground state. It better be that the part in the limit L goes to infinity our energy vanishes. That had better be true. In fact, the only sorry, the only kind of energy that a scale invariant theory can have is what what proportional to length? 
1 over length because e is of dimension 1 by n. So, scale invariant theories are allowed to have things proportional to 1 by n, but no other nothing else you see explicitly right this is a scale this is of dimension mass square. Is this clear? So, what we are going to do is to examine this part carefully, break it up into its length independences and cancel any offending in it with a counter term. What is left behind we will not be able to cancel and that will be physical. Is this clear? Okay. one of the E equations of motion which was uh, yes the fact that the plus minus that we had only yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the fact that we did not need to separately impose P plus minus is equal to 0 yeah. came from the fact that that's classically the theory was wide enough. Where did we get these conditions from? We just took the classical Lagrangian, yeah. varied and wrote down the action the constraint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we will we will see this more clearly as we go on, but, but what we will see is unless the theory actually behaves while in there. It would basically be the statement that this t plus minus equation was not really 0 in the quantum theory. Okay, that is another way of seeing the problem. Okay, fine. So, motivated by all this, as I say, we are taking a relatively crude approach at the moment. So, you will see the answer first. You will see, we will understand this in great detail covariantly in encountering many beautiful th structures in theoretical physics over the next five or six lectures. But for now, you already see that this divergence, if it is a term proportional to L, can be cancelled by a counter term. And from the point of view of scale invariance, which is a subset of while invariance, must be cancelled by counter term. Okay, otherwise, we do not get a scale invariant term. So now, what is left is to understand this, this sum better. Well, we'll see. No, the cosmological. Yeah, I think we with the cosmological and constant field add is minus infinity, so as to cancel plus infinity, so that you get minus one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So now what we're going to do is to learn to count. We're going to learn to sum. We're going to learn to sum one plus two plus three plus four. Okay. Now, suppose of the length of our thing was not l but two pi l, so that two pi factors don't <coughs> enter all the time. <coughs> what we want to do is to understand how to sum n by l. Okay, that n will be replaced by n by l. Can you see this? Because it's the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. It's massless mode. So frequency is equal to momentum. Why was it n? Because the momenta on the on the two pi length string were one, two, three, four, and because it was a massless field, omega was equal to momentum. Omega is still equal to momentum because it's massless field, but now when we've got length 2 pi l, the momenta will be n by l. Is this clear? So we need to understand how to sum this. N is equal to 1 t. We need to understand how to sum this. What do I mean? We need to understand, you know, we work, we work, this is a quantum field theory, and we have to make sense of this thing. So every time we've got something divergent in a quantum field theory, we first regulate it. So let's do that. Okay. So suppose p is, is the physical momentum. That's n by l. Consider some function f of p by lambda. Okay. Well, lambda is some very big number. With the property that this f starts out at zero. Maybe it's smooth here. We'll see what properties we need for it. But eventually, around argument 1 smoothly goes to, sorry, starts off at 1. So f of x versus x. f starts out at 1 so that it doesn't change the summation for, for values of p that are small compared to lambda. 
Okay? I'm just going to multiply f of n by, by, lum, uh, by L lambda to this. This gives me what I mean by a regulated sum. Now, I want to emphasize a couple of things. It's very important that this function is a function of p and not of n. Okay? Because p is con conjugate to absolute length. n is conjugate to length in units of L. When we put a cutoff, we should not be putting a separate cutoff depending on what length manifold we are quantizing on this here. Okay? If we do that, then we will have to put you know, length dependent cutoffs here. We want, to we want to regulate the theory in an absolute short distance way independent of where it stays. So we do that regulation by putting this envelope function as a function of p and not a function of m. Do you understand this? Is that because of we are putting it locally and it comes after Exactly. That's what we want to do. We want to locally, in a short distance way, look at little region and regulate the divergences. Okay? This is totally crucial because every, all the algebra I'm doing would not work if you just put this to be a function of n by you know, n by some number, n by, let's say, let me regulate the sum at some large integer m. That's wrong. It's wrong because that is cutting, that is defining theories differently depending on what manifold they live. What we want to do is to define a theory and then put it on a manifold. So the theory is defined in an intrinsic way without knowing what the manifold is. P is an intrinsic coordinate. The momentum conjugate to distance doesn't need definition of where you are. Is this clear? Okay. Now this f is any function. Everything I say should not depend on what f is. Otherwise, I get different answers. Depend different ways of regulating will give me different answers. And I want to I want to evaluate the sum. And you you're wondering uh, how how on earth am I going to do that? Now, you know every once in a while the mathematicians come up with something that totally amazes you. <laughs> 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 Uh, and this is one of those cases. There's this thing called the Euler-Maclaurian formula. There's this thing called the Euler-Maclaurian formula, which see, I've never gone through a proof of. It sounds almost like a miracle, but I, I'll just quote it for you. Okay, tells you that I'm uh, I'm sure with uh, about twenty thousand uh, fine print issues, but uh, f of zero by two plus f one plus f two plus let's let's call this something else. g of 0 by 2 plus g1 plus g2 plus blah 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 if you have a sum like this 1 to infinity euler maclaurian tell you that this is equal to integral 0 to infinity gx dx minus g prime 0 by 12 plus g triple prime 0 by some other number, some fancy number, Bernoulli number, some, some fancy numbers appear in this time. Okay, and it goes on forever. Luckily, we won't need anything more than the 12. Okay? So if you're, you're not, yeah, it sounds quite like, like quite an amazing formula. But anyway, if you're not too skeptical about it, I'm going to use this one. So this formula, uh, how am I going to use it? Well, what is my g? This is my g. This whole thing here is g. Okay? Now, this g has this irritating g of 0 by 2, but for me, g of 0 is 0 because of the n, so it doesn't play a role. Okay? So, what I have is the left-hand side of this. All I have to do is identify g. So, this is integral x by L, f of x, by L lambda, that's this first term, <coughs> minus x by L, f of x by L lambda, prime plus triple prime, and so on. That's what this is equal to. What? Ah, uh, one by twelve. Okay, now let's.
let's first evaluate this. Well, since we don't know much about f, we can't say too much about it, but we can pull out the dependence on various uh, quantities. Because this thing is integral dx. Uh, let's see. It'll go like L and then uh, lambda square. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Now we'll change variables to y, which is x by L lambda. Okay. So if I change variables to y, which is x by L lambda, you see I get dy f of y y dy. Simple change of variables. Is this clear? The first dy gives a, uh, so y was y was equal to x by L lambda. The first dy gives, gives one, uh, uh, you know, the y dy gives two L by lambdas, L by lambda square. That cancels to give just one, the one by L, which was here. Now, this is just an integral of a function. We've chosen it to go to a zero at infinity. So it's a number, some pure number. I don't care what it is, okay? So this part is equal to L lambda squared times a number. What that number is depends on what envelope function f I use. That's fine. Okay? Now before making a big deal of this, let's see what else is there. We have this, uh, this prime and this triple prime. Now let's see. You see, not this. Uh, exactly. When I hit this on x, I get one prime. What about the triple prime? Well, I don't want an x be left behind, so I'll have one of the primes hit x. The other two will have to hit this. But every time you hit a, an x, you get a 1 by L lambda, L lambda, the whole. And lambda is treated as a very large number. So every other term is order 1 by lambda squared, at least. We're interested in the limit lambda going to infinity. So all these other terms in that limit are just 0. So this is the only other term that survives. OK? Then it's also 0. So the only, and it's, it's 0 for two reasons. First, there's an x. Second, there's a 1 by lambda. <laughs> OK? So the only thing that, that actually survives is when it hits the x. And so what we've got is that we've concluded that sum over n by l is equal to number times lambda squared l minus. Now, when this prime hits x, we have f of 0. But f of 0 had to be 1. So that's 1 minus 1 by 12 L. This is true for all L, and so it's true for L equals 1. Uh, sorry, yeah, for L, L equals 1, the case we were working on. Now you see, what we're going to do is to choose the cosmological counter, co constant counter term to cancel this. But we cannot cancel the minus 1 by 12 L. That is physical. Okay? So the sum over n is going to be replaced by minus 1 by 12. And so our formula becomes m squared is equal to sum over i. So i is equal to 1 to d minus 2. Sum over n is equal to 1 to infinity. 4 by alpha prime. Mm. Can somebody remind me if the alpha prime was outside? Wait, uh, let's say. Uh, 4 alpha n i minus n i. OK. Yeah. 4 by alpha prime. Let's put the 4 by alpha prime right out here. Alpha n minus n i alpha n i. And then there was a plus n by 2. So that becomes uh, uh, 1 by 24 with a minus. Without the? Yeah, without the n sum. So let's put, you're right. So let's put this separate. 
He said that's minus 4 by alpha prime into d minus 2 by 24. Are we all good? Uh, these 26 something good with that. <laughs> okay. So now we're almost so so now we're almost good. We've completed our quantization of the strings. But you know, whenever you go through uh, an exercise that is this has even this level of complexity. The exercise we have is not very complicated. It has a certain level of complexity. And it involved breaking some good symmetry in the middle. What was the symmetry we broke in the middle? You know, physical symmetry, Lorentz invariance. You know, we had a theory that had d-dimensional Lorentz invariance, and in, our, in the middle of our process, we broke it. Unless you're very, very, very careful. If you break it in your process, you'll break it in the answer. If you're very, very, very careful, of course, you won't. This is a very good test. Where, where is the Choice of gauge. X plus, x plus x minus. See, all we have here is these i's, which manifestly preserve S O D minus 2. But there's no manifest S O uh, S O D asymmetry in our, in our story. So great check whenever you go through an exercise like this is are the symmetries that should have been there in your problem really there in the answer? So now we've got this, this, this nice formula, and what we're going to do is to ask, can this formula be written in a SOB invariant way? Now what do I mean by that? I'm going to remind you of the following thing. What we've got is a bunch of free particles, right? And I've listed the masses of these particles. All I know is the masses. They may have other additional spins. We've not kept track of that. Okay, but if I have a theory in d dimensions, and it is Lorentz invariant, then there is this lovely theory of free representation of the Poincaré algebra in d dimensions. I'm going to remind you of this, the result of this theory. And you tell me if you know about it. If you don't, I'll suggest a reference. Okay, the result, or maybe I'll give you. Minute overview. The result of the study of the Poincare algebra and d dimensions tells you it goes as follows. It says that wave, wave, you know, wave representations of the Poincare algebra in d dimensions are of two types: massless and massive. Massless representations are in representations of fields. Little. Yes, that lie in representations of the little group. Actually, both massless and massive, both line representation of the little group. The little group is the part of the Lorentz group that stabilizes one particular momentum vector that the particle can have. So if the particle is a massive particle, its momentum vector is time, some time-like vector. So let's rotate that so that that becomes time. The part of rotations that stabilizes that is S of D minus 1. So particles free particles have to appear in massive particles have to appear in representations of s o d minus 1 on the other hand if you've got a massless particle the little group is the part that stabilizes um, a light like vector and apart from some trivial thing that plays no role in the representation theory it's s o d minus 2 so a light like vector let's say x minus there's an s o d minus 2 rotation that stabilizes there's some trivial addition piece, but plays no role in the end. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, the final result of that analysis is that all massive representations of particles appear in representations of S O D minus one, whereas massless representations appear in re representations of S O D minus two. Now you see that is an obvious way to check this formula, because everything that we have is manifestly covariant in SOD minus 2. 
but all, all or at least all of almost all of these particles are going to be mass uh, massive. So then there are group up into representations of SOD minus one. Unless that happens, we're in trouble. Does it happen? Yes or no? Okay. So it's truth time you now. We've gone through a lot of <laughs> blah blah blah. That doesn't work. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Let's first give this guy a name. Okay, let's put this four by alpha prime out of here. And let's give this guy a name. Let's call it N. N is the harmonic oscillator number minus that's that shape. Remember that both on the left and the right, n has to be the same. So the smallest but allowed value of this n, um, let me, you know, because I don't want to keep shifting, let me call this part n. So the energy is n minus the shift. Okay? Smallest allowed value of n is obviously 0. How many states are there with 0? Energy 0. One, because every harmonic oscillator has to annihilate the vacuum, so that you get zero. Okay, so so n is equal to zero, unique state. M squared is equal to minus four by alpha prime into d minus two by twenty-four. Is this clear? Okay. What about n equals 1? Can we get n equals 1 first, please? Yes, we can. Now, let's remember that this, these alphas, that the energy associated, the eigenvalues of this guy came from the commutators of the alphas. And so, m units of, uh, p units of occupation of the nth oscillator have energy p times n. Remember, the nth oscillator is an oscillator with energy p times n. That it's, I've not written the n out here because it's hidden in the commutation relations. But you have to remember that alpha n is an oscillator with energy n. Okay? So any alpha n for n greater than 1, if it tries to hit the vacuum, will give you energy 2 or higher. So that doesn't work. But n equals 1 can work. Okay. So we have d minus 2 from the left. Now if n is equal to 1 from the left, it has to be 1 from the right because of the level matching condition, okay, times d minus 2 from the right. Now, through this whole thing, we are always going to get something from the left and something identical from the right, okay. So, I am not going to keep writing the right. Everything will work sector by sector, so we won't, there will be no interference, we won't have to worry about it, okay. So, let us first focus just on the left. We have got d minus 2 states. How do these d minus 2 states transform under SO d minus 2? By the vector, because they were created by alpha i, okay, which was a vector. Is this in a representation of SO d minus 1? Well, does there exist an SO d minus 1 representation which has d, 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 which is d minus, which under restriction to SO d minus 2 reduces to an SO d minus 2 vector and nothing else? Not. Okay, there's the SOD minus one vector, but that reduces to an SOD minus two vector plus a scalar. Mm. Try, there's nothing that does it. So it looks like already at the first test we failed. All our particles we thought should be in representations of SOD minus one. But just the first massive state, I mean the first guy that is not trivial was in a representation of SOD minus two. So it looks bad. Wait, wait, wait. Not completely bad because suppose this particle happened to be massless. Then it should be in a representation of SOD minus 2. How would that work? It would work if D minus 2 by 24 was 1. Because then 1 minus 1 would give us 0. So we are dead unless D is equal to 26. So now we've got an infinite number of conditions to fulfill. The first one has already taken the only freedom we had and set it to something fixed. 
what you should bet if you are a betting person is that on the second one we'd be dead anyway. <laughs> 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 but let's check, you know, let's try. What we did didn't sound too unreasonable. Pulchinsky also did it. So, <laughs> so uh, let's, <laughs> let's see how it goes. So let's try the second one. Okay. So the argument is that uh, this appears to be in representation of f of g minus 2, and hence uh, this has uh, to be a massless state. Yeah, it cannot, and there is no S O D minus 1 representing re representation that under restriction to S O D minus 2 gives this content. Okay, so this is not in a representation of S O D minus 1. Too bad. Okay, so it, the only way it could be consistent with Lorentz invariance is that this was a master state. Now, however, we've used up our freedom, so there are no parameters left to play with. So now it had either better work or not. Yes, go on. Uh, we, we, we're coming. Let's try n equals two. Then, then you ask your question. Suppose now n is equal to two. Now let us list all the states that we get with n equals two. Somebody help me. Okay. So one suggestion is let's take alpha minus two i on zero. That's a great suggestion. How many such states do we have? D minus two. We can also call that twenty-four now. Since we know that, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's call this so that 24 states. Any other states at level two? N equals two. Exactly. There's also alpha i minus one, alpha i minus one, alpha j minus one. Now, instead of just listing how many, we'll also list what representation of S O D minus two. So this is big. Isn't the vector? Okay, I'll like an AI of SO2. What representation is this in SO2? It's what? And what kind of tensor? Symmetric. 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 Alpha 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 why are you going bothering to go through all the details? Doesn't matter what crazy representations you get, they're all representations of S O D minus two. But the question is, could it be that these are secretly in a representation of S O D minus one, but we're only seeing the S O D minus two properties because th that's the only thing we have managed. So the question mathematically is, is there a representation or a group of representations of uh, of SOD minus 1, which under restriction, if you only look at the p how it transforms under SOD minus 2, will reduce to this. Okay? Now, SIJ by itself is not an irreducible representation of SOD minus 2. This is not very important, but let me just say it. It's not traceless. Exactly. It breaks up into the trace and the traceless part. So actually, we have three <coughs> representations here of SOD minus 2 the vector, the traceless symmetric tensor and the trace part. Now I'm going to ask you, can you, can you think of a representation of S O D minus 1, which under restriction to D S O D minus 2 will reduce to this content? Very good. Uh, in fact, a traceless symmetric. Excellent. So the, the suppose I take Pij, where Ij are now d minus 1 variables. Okay, let's call it d, d mu j. Okay, first let's remove the tracelessness part. We'll come to that. Suppose it was just a tensor. Then how does it decompose in representations of SOD minus 1? Well, it's very simple. Either this last index is the dth index, okay, let's give that a special name, let's call it an x, okay, uh, or it's one of these i indices. So 
the simplest thing could be is Tij. That matches up with Fx. Or it could be Tix. This matches up with Ai. Or it could be Txx. Now, that we don't have. You see, this was a, a, an arbitrary trace. You symmetric tensor B minus 1 with no trace condition. So this mapped up the full thing. This Txx is extra. So we just put the tracelessness condition that removes one combination of the trace of this and this, which then could map up to the trace of the remaining combination, the some linear combination of the Txx and the trace of Tij. Uh, one combination is removed, the other one that's not removed could map up to the trace of Sij. Is this clear? And so it works. The traceless symmetric tensor of SOD minus 1 has exactly the matter content, the uh, group theory content, as the three representations of SOD mi uh, D minus the 2 that we saw. So the traceless symmetric representation of SO25 is exactly the content to match up with the representations of SO24 that we've seen. OK. Uh, I'm going to leave it for an exercise for you to try the next layer. Try n equals 3. It also works. In fact, one can prove that it works at every layer. I won't go through the proof here, because we'll go so much more elegant proofs. But one can prove that, th that at every level apart from 1, the representation content of this oscillator system is actually can be decomposed in the representations of SOD. Now, this is a good reason to believe that we've done something good. You see, because I told you that if you break gauge, then you should go and check whether your answer, break a symmetry, you should check whether your answer has that symmetry. And if it doesn't, of course, you made a mistake. But the flip side of the story is that if you've broken the, the, the thing in your calculation, and the answer has it, then suddenly you begin to trust your calculation much more than you would otherwise. OK? So now we're going to take this, 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 this result seriously. We're going to see this. We're going to take seriously the idea that at d is equal to 26, this theory, oh, oh our procedure made sense. Now I want to emphasize one thing. The procedure didn't make complete sense. Why? We see this from answer. From answer, what we see is that while n equals 1 had 0 mass, n equals 0 had what mass? Yes, a negative mass equal to minus 4 by alpha, mass square. Negative mass square equals minus 4 by alpha prime. Now, what is, what is a mass square? If you've got a potential for some scalar, mass, mass, you work around some extremum of that potential. Mass square is the second derivative of that potential. Positive mass square says you're expanding around a point like this. Negative mass square tells you you're expanding around a point like this. Expansions around negative mass square sometimes uh, the particles that you get by expanding around negative mass square are sometimes called tachyons. People sometimes say tachyons move faster than light. Total nonsense. <laughs> Sudarshan said, said that. He invented that. Okay. It's <laughs> total nonsense. Okay. It's total nonsense because theory is de del phi, the whole thing squared, plus V of phi, you can prove is a causal theory. So if you have a if you, ha you take the theory, you balance it here classically. Then you turn on a source here. The response will always be in the form of light. It may look like it's moving faster than the speed of light when you do some wave packet analysis. But it doesn't really. There's no issue with the problem with tachyons is not that they move faster than light. We heard a lot of this nonsense when people claimed that neutrinos were moving faster than light. Maybe they're tachyons. <laughs> <laughs> Total misunderstanding of what tachyons are. OK? The problem with tachyons is that they represent an instability. It's not violating some basic principle of physics. It's just that you've chosen to expand around a point that is unstable. And now there are two possibilities. Either it's unstable, and when you start rolling, you will never recover. You just keep going. Then you're working in a completely fixed state. 
Another possibility is that it's like this. It's like uh, it's the Mexican hat potential, and you just chose to expand around the po uh, top. You roll, you come to the bottom, and you find everything is good. Which is it for the bosonic string? This thing that we've that I've told you about, it's called the bosonic string. Which is it for the bosonic string? Actually, amazingly enough, nobody really knows. I suppose if you had to bet, you would guess that it's of the bad kind. But nobody really knows, because it's very hard to follow this flow in any control room. So whether there is some minimum, some well-defined theory with a you know, bottom, and this is in that there's a bump in the potential of the well-defined theory about which you're expanding to find this bosonic string, nobody really knows. Anyway, practically speaking, it's not very important to us, you know, though in some deep in principle way we may not have failed in our attempt to quantize the string, in a practical way we have, because who cares about some expansion around an unstable part? It's not a very interesting thing. Okay. So this quantization of the string, you see, was quite constrained. This quantization about the of the string was quite constrained, but it led to an answer that was not very feasible. Whether it is an uncurable in unphysicality or a curable one, it's not very clear. But the expansion is going to give you garbage. You start looking at quantum fluctuations around this point. It'll set the thing rolling and it'll just keep rolling. I mean, keep rolling till you maybe hit some minimum far away, but perturbation theory won't do that. Okay. Now since this didn't quite work, why did I spend maybe two or three lectures talking about it? I did for the following reason. That there is a close cousin of what we've just studied. The close cousin of what we've just studied is called the fermionic string. Okay. There are varieties of fermionic string. They're called type 2a theory, type 2b theory, and heterotic theory. We share all the good things about this theory, but not the bad things. Okay. There's no negative mass square scalar. There's no instant. They give you expansions around states. Okay, And much of the technique of analysis of those theories is very similar to what, what we've seen here. Okay, So what we are now going to do is for the next three or four lectures, better understand the boson string. And then we will introduce and better understand the fermion string. And then we will try, I've never done this before in the course, but I'll try, uh, to, no, not seriously, uh, we'll try to study these two things in parallel. Okay, uh, the structure of Kulchinsky's book, that he spends the first volume on the bosonic string, the next vol volume on the fermionic string, we'll try as an experiment to mix and match. I hope that will not uh, be too, uh, we won't find the technicalities too, too daunting. We'll, we'll try this. Okay, so uh, from next lecture on, uh, though, yeah. So the next lecture on is, and uh, we are going to attempt to better understand our quantization of the string. First, starting with the bosonic string and then moving on. Okay. What do I mean by better understand? Well, there are two things that were not very satisfactory in our treatment. Our treatment was a rough and dirty treatment. Rough and dirty in what way? Well, firstly, we worked in an. Firstly, it was inelegant. Right? We broke Lorentz. Secondly, we fixed things in a sort of rough and dirty way. Look, we fixed that D was 26 by demanding Lorentz invariance. And we, sh we saw that Lorentz invariance of the spectrum was not obviously violated at higher levels. But maybe it is. Maybe interactions of these strings, when we understand how to put them in, violate Lorentz invariance. Huh? You know, it's not very satisfying. So what we'd like to do is to work in a way that makes it clear from the beginning Every, that everything is okay. Understand structurally why things go wrong. And also work in a way so that we can understand not just free string theory, which is what we did here, but interacting string theory. Okay? In order to do that, we're going to work in a different gauge. We will not use this light cone gauge. Okay? We will continue to use what is sometimes called conformal gauge. That is, we will continue to set the metric on the world sheet of the string to pro be proportional to eta, alpha, beta, at least locally, patch by patch, like we did. But we will not then, in addition, 
okay? Use light cone gauge. Instead, we will, as you will see, we will, we will pursue a path integral approach to understanding the string and uh, uh, end up understanding it at a much deeper level. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to say in this lecture, I beg. Um, in this process of trying to understand the string well, you see, all we're going to do differently actually is to you know, not impose light cone gauge. That's not really the point what, what, what I want to say now. We've already seen that when we try to understand the string, we end up with a theory that has both while and diffeomorphism invariant. Now, if you have while and diffeomorphism invariants, okay, then we've already seen in our way of quantizing the string that conformal transformations, namely those diffeomorphisms that can be compensated for by while transformations, are redundancies of description, are gate symmetries of arithmetic. Okay? So clearly, the structure of the theories that appear in the world sheet of the string have an interesting interplay with conformal field theory. Right? Because there is a cla whole class of quantum field theories that, ha that are invariant, or almost invariant, under those diffeomorphisms that can be undone by, by wild symmetries. These are called conformal field theories. Yes? What do I mean by class of quantum field theories? Not all quantum field theories have this property. It's QCD. That if you divide conform, uh, field theories into classes, some of the field theories have this property. Uh, almost invariant. Okay. Uh, you will see as I as we proceed. The almost invariant will be that interesting unitary conformal field theories often have always have what is called a conformal anomaly. Okay, it's a small violation of conformal invariance, which nonetheless is serious enough that string theory will not allow it. This violation of conformal invariance is, is parameterized by something called the central charge. Okay, and uh, one of the constraints, the way we will get d equals 26 in our more sophisticated way of working, is by demanding that the central charge of the full field theory that lie on the world sheet of the string vanish. But hang on, you'll you'll see, you'll see, okay. So I I wanted to say these last words just to motivate the following thing, that from the next class onwards we will begin begin an intensive study of the structure of two-dimensional conformal field theories. Okay, um, once we understand these theories well, we will return to quantizing the string first the Fer bosonic and then the fermionic string in an in a more complete way. Uh, and the interplays with conformal, the structures of conformal field theory will be impo important in this exercise. Okay. And that's it for now, uh, unless there are questions or comments. I have a question. So, <coughs> uh, tachyon is an integrity in many field theory. So, uh, and this is probably a dumb question, but what exactly does tachyon condensate mean? And uh, how does uh, tachyon condensate means this. Suppose you start here. Mm -hmm. Now you hit the theory. It starts rolling. Mm -hmm. It could roll here and settle down. Yeah. This phase. So we get that will be heat condensate. Well, this is what in this context is called the tachyon. Ah, yes. It's a condensate of the field ah. which was tachyonic oh, about this okay. If this happened to be a Higgs potential, it would be. Mm -hmm. But it could be a field that had no, you know, it's not coupled to any gauge theory. Could be there's no symmetry. Could be like this. Yeah. This what? What? Say again. Huh? You're right. You pick up. You pick up a point. But suppose you started ar around the uh, the false maximum. Uh, yeah. Then you would roll. Right. Hmm. And uh, that phenomenon would be. Would be tachyon condensation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, other questions or comments? Can I, uh, when you study this, uh, for example, from the
motion are not just states that don't obey the equation of motion, they're not even well defined in height, they're not part of the Hilbert space. This is because the Hilbert space we're looking at is the Hilbert space on the world sheet. It's not the space time Hilbert space. Space time Hilbert space, you can look at a state and then change its Hamiltonian, at least in ordinary quantum field theory. Maybe not in string theory in some deep way, but it should be some more subtle thing. Um, for these reasons, harder, it's not so easy to ask the question you're asking. Because a point on this potential here is well defined. It's the point about which it's expanding. Small fluctuations around this are well defined. But to ask what is this, that means staying here without rolling, that's not obeying your equation of motion. So the kind of question you could try to ask is set this tachyon rolling and see where it goes. So yeah. You know, so we don't have the analog of this potential picture because that's an off-shell picture. Okay? No, we don't at least yet. What we can try to do is explore the neighborhood by looking at solutions to equations of motion. People use various other tricks. Renormalization group flow on the world sheet of the string is also good. Um, okay? All this, there's been a lot of discussion of some, some part of which I even participated in at some point didn't lead very far, it didn't go very far. Okay, so, you know, so it's a great question, but the techniques I'm going to be lecturing about will not, at least at the beginning, will not help you solve it. Now there's another technique that people deal with, it's called string field theory. That is an off-shell formalism of string theory. And that would in principle produce such things bang on. However, there are many issues, why string field theory, you know, had I been giving this lecture course five years ago, I would have said, don't waste your time on string field theory. It's not taught us anything we didn't know. That's no longer true. Ashok can collaborate us. Use string field theory to prove the unitarity of string perturbation theory. It's a fantastic, a great accomplishment. So. but it was always there. Now, what is the content of this? Can somebody break this up into representations for me? Vector times vector. Symmetric Perfect. Exactly. You take S mu nu, you either symmetrize or anti-symmetrize, and once you symmetrize, you can also take over the trace. So trace, symmetric, and anti-symmetric. Now, what have we got? We, we found a theory in which the massless mods, there's a scalar, there's an anti-symmetric tensor, okay. But what's really interesting is that there's a symmetric tensor. Why is that interesting? This is interesting because when you take Einstein gravity and linearize it around the vacuum, you get a symmetric tensor, traceless symmetric tensor. As your Moreover, there is this folk theorem, okay. If any one of you have had the energy to read through Feynman's lectures on gravitation, it, it, I ran out of energy by chapter 10 or so. <laughs> very confusing and very confused lecture sessions. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, if, you, if you look at that, he will have claimed by the end to almost have proved that any theory that has a massless symmetric tensor in spectrum 
and that is unitary necessarily is governed by a theory that is that is diffeomorphism invariant. You mean what mode, what normalized? But what's wrong with having two? No, we should have two. Okay. Okay, so suppose I take, suppose I take uh, not Maxwell e Lagrangian, but D mu A mu whole thing square. So this is my Lagrangian thing. Why do we start with such a complicated action like Maxwell's? Why not this? alpha mi uh, minus mu, uh, well, if you do the canonical quantization of this theory, you will find the following, that if you choose A's to be the guys that annihilate the vacuum, so that you, ha so that you have a, a, a Hamiltonian that is bounded from below, then you will find the following commutation relations. You will find that A mu A nu dagger is equal to my uh, is equal to eta mu nu. Exactly. Where see you'll you'll find some uh, some
The only way we figure out how for the massless theory sort of makes sense of this is to get rid of the zero, the negative norm states by making them pure gauge. By saying there is something which, which excludes them. Similarly, with massless symmetric fields. The symmetry there though was forced, is forced by on general grounds to be a no, non, you know, not to be an abelian symmetry. And to be, you know, this is the starting point of Feynman's analysis. He tries to get rid of the zero, the neg negative norm modes, he has to introduce a symmetry. And then to work at higher and higher orders in amplitude expansion, he needs to correct the symmetry as well. And he shows, or he claims to show, or he thinks he's claimed to show, that uh, uh, when you go Exactly, 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 exactly. The theorem is in Minkowski space, but doesn't matter, doesn't matter. The, the point here is that here what we got here was a massless symmetric tensor mode. So it's a pretty fair guess that what we produced is a theory of gravity. Okay. Now, now let's get back to your question. Uh, Indra Neil's question, we really need to wind up soon, but in the Neil's question was, why did we start working around a flat bag? Were we studying quantum field theory? It should be generalizing from a flat background. Right. So, Indranil's point is we do not really know the equations of motion of string theory. So, what do, we, what do we mean? Well, we know these equations, whatever they are, should reduce at low energies to gravity and be corrected. But it should be that there are equations of motion. We should not be allowed to start around anything. Right. So, one of the beautiful results that we will review in this course is that this construction of string theory, and that is part of the point of the next few lectures this construction of string theory that we will undergo will not restrict us to start around flat space, but will allow us to start around
between you know the question of starting a, about more general backgrounds will appear in our studies and will also help us to understand the equations of motion history. But that will come as we go. Okay, any 